Wei is an assistant professor in medical engineering here at Caltech. And we are very proud to say that he was our first hire into the medical engineering department, at, um, first assistant professor hire in the medical engineering department. So we're very proud. Um, and of course, he's also one of our KNI affiliated faculty members. Let me tell you a little bit, uh, Wei has received so many recognitions even at this very early stage of his career. So I won't go through all of them. So I'll just briefly introduce some. Wei received his PhD in chemical engineering at UC San Diego, so just our, our neighbors down south, where he was a Jacobs Fellow and an HHMI International Student Research Fellow. Then he went on to a postdoc fellowship at UC Berkeley in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences, or as we say, EECS. Wei is an associate editor of Science Advances. I, I hope many of you know this journal. It's a terrific sister to science and has been honored with many, many awards and accolades, including the IEEE EMBS Early Career Achievement Award, the IEEE Sensor Council Technical Achievement Award, MIT Technology Review's list of 35 innovators under 35. This is a particularly um, uh, meaningful recognition, um, and the World Economic Forum's Young Scientists. Here at Caltech, Wei and his group develop innovative bioelectronic devices that are paving the way for more personalized precision medicine. Their devices include wearable biosensors for real-time health monitoring and medical micro robots for rapid drug delivery and precision surgery. Today, Wei will be presenting on telemedicine biosensors for personalized healthcare. Now, more than ever, there's a great interest and need for telemedicine and at-home predictive analytics and diagnosis, of course, very relevant uh, to this pandemic. Wei will discuss his group's efforts in developing fully integrated, skin-interfaced, flexible biosensors that use markers found in sweat for non-invasive molecular analysis. These sensors are capable of physiological monitoring, disease diagnosis, mental health assessment, and drug personalization. Wei will also discuss his team's recent work on a device called SARS-CoV-2 RapidPlex, a graphene-based biosensor for COVID-19 diagnosis and management. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that you are welcome to submit your questions through the Q&A feature for Wei to answer after his talk, and we'll keep track of all of them. The talk, of course, is being recorded, as you just saw, and will be posted on the KNI's YouTube page. And now I'd like to welcome Professor Wei Gao to present his wonderful seminar. Please take it over. Thank you very much, Julia, for the kind introduction. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to have a great opportunity to share our research through the Can I special seminar. So I'm Wei Gao, as Julia mentioned. Uh, today, I would like to share with you our recent work on telemedicine biosensors for personalized healthcare. Uh, my group, uh, it's fairly new, three and a half years ago, we started at Caltech and uh, in the Department of Medical Engineering, focusing on translational research. Right now we have a, a around 15 members and we are developing bioelectronic devices for personalized and precision healthcare. So today I will mainly uh, talk about our main focus area, wearable portable biosensors. As we know, we are facing a great challenge, COVID-19 pandemic. I just updated this number today. I see it's already uh, 100 million cases around the world of COVID-19. And the deaths has passed 2.16 million. And in the United States, we account for already over one quarter cases and uh, over 435 k deaths. So it's a major challenge we are facing right now. Uh, right now, I, as you know, telemedicine, we have realized that telemedicine can play such important role in combat COVID-19 in several different ways. So people use you know, various telemedicine tools for contact tracing, and we could develop you know, uh, rapid tests for point of care uh, COVID-19 diagnosis, and also very importantly, the wearable portable um, devices for at home diagnostic and health monitoring could be very important to, to like uh, in personalized healthcare, because right now, you know, most of the places ideally will not want to go to a clinic uh, in, uh, all the time because of the risk of the COVID infection. And if we could monitor uh, the house at home, uh, this would be very attractive. So uh, there have been already many commercial available house monitors we could track the important biomarkers of vital signs related to COVID-19, for example, temperature, respiration, heart rate, you know. Uh, the largest set of data collected by uh, the wearable biosensors 
coupled with machine learning could be very meaningful to identify the covenant infection early and identify the risk much earlier, in fact, as well. And uh, we all know that this wearable sensor will play a very important role even after this COVID-19. And uh, if uh, already, you know, recently years, we see more and more commercially available house monitors, uh, you know, such as Apple Watch or Fitbit, they can track our house during our physical activities. But if you look at uh, what's available right now, mostly they can track uh, physical activities or vital signs. Uh, like Apple Watch, they can do heart, like heart rate, EKG already, but I fail to provide more useful information about our house at a molecule level. So we think a major challenge, which is also a major uh, great opportunity uh, in this field right now is how can we track our house continuously at a molecule level? How can we monitor the chemical biomarkers from our body fluids continuously and ideally non-invasively? Right now, you know, think about uh, like what's a com continuous chemical sensor. Uh, we can imagine uh, uh, like a ba basically the continuous glucose monitor. That's the only uh, major product available. So to be able to track our house non-invasively, we are actually mainly looking at the human sweat. As we know, sweat is a very important body fluid and we can retrieve sweat sample continuously, non-invasively, uh, and uh, dynamic in this case. And we can identify many important analyte or biomarkers from our soil samples, including uh, electrolyte, such as sodium, chloride, uh, calcium, including also metabolites, such as glucose, lactate, uric acid. We can also see uh, over 30 amino acids, over 300 proteins from our skin. And uh, we, we can also identify you know, heavy metals and drugs, such as substances in our sweat. So imagine that if we can track the sweat, we could potentially non-invasively uh, get information about uh, our molecular biomarker information. Sweat biosensor or sweat analysis is not something new. It has been there for decades. People have been using sweat analysis for disease diagnosis. One classic example is cystic fibrosis diagnosis. You know, cystic fibrosis is a genetic lung disease. The diagnosis, the gold standard, is based on sweat chloride. So these sweat tests can also be used for doping control, drug dosage control, or genomic studies. But you know, people may say there is not that many uh, clinical you know, gold standards based on sweat out of cystic fibrosis. That is true because uh, in the past, you know, how people do the sweat test, people put a sweat patch on the skin, they collect the sweat sample over 24 hours or even several days. Then eventually they send a sample to a lab to you know, use a mass spectrum to analyze biomarkers in human sweat. As you can imagine, uh, this is long-term average data. In fact, our sweat biomarker level vary over, you know, like all the time, uh, taking one, point, average point over several days does not really provide much meaningful information. That was one of the major problems for the past sweat test. Imagine that if we could develop a wearable platform that can continuously track this molecular information from our skin in our daily activities, we could use this type of information for fitness tracking for disease diagnosis. And especially right now is the data-driven work. If we uh, couple the large set of data collection from data activity with the machine learning, big data analysis. This will enable numerous fundamental and clinical investigations and it will play a major role in preventive care. So we have a few review articles on this topic. If you have interest, you're welcome to read. In 2016, we developed our first platform for a multiplex sweat sensor. So as you can see, it is a fully integrated system uh, it's entirely, the entire system is flexible. We can wear these at different body parts. And this system can perform real-time uh, metabolic monitoring, uh, electrolyte sensing, as well as skin temperature monitoring. So the system can perform on-site signal conditioning, processing, and a wireless transmission. So eventually all the data will be sent to cell phone through Bluetooth wirelessly and displayed on a, a, a custom developed cell phone app. So, of course, there are many other uh, like uh, uh, groups working on this topic, including Professor Joseph Wong at UCSD, Professor Jason Hackenfield at University of Cincinnati, and Professor John Rogers at Northwestern, and Professor Diane Kim at uh, Seoul National University. These are some examples of other groups working on sweat sensor. Before I talk about uh, you know application of a sweat sensor, I want to briefly introduce the basic sensing mechanism used in biosensors, in wearable biosensors. So, firstly, enzymatic sensors. 
if we want to detect glucose uh, lactate, for example, this type of metabolites. So very commonly, people will use uh, enzymatic electro. But, uh, in this case, we are using a specific enzyme, which is se uh, selective to the target. For example, for glucose detection, we are using glucose oxidase, which can catalyze glucose oxidation to gener generate glucolinic acid and hydrogen peroxide. So we are detecting this uh, chemical reaction. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there are different generation of glucose sensor generation one by detecting hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we are actually using generation two glucose sensor utilizing a, a redox mediator with the prussian blue here we are using. Uh, the way we are using prussian blue, one of the major reason is that we can operate the glucose sensor at a very low voltage. If we want to detect hydrogen peroxide based on generation one glucose sensor, we need to apply very high voltage like 0.6, 0.7 volt. But in you know, generation two glucose sensor, we're using prussian blue as a redox mediator. We can just even operate sensor at around zero volt, which can miniaturize the influence from other electroactive molecules. So for glucose and lactate sensor, this type of enzymatic sensor, we are measuring the current output between the enzyme electrode and the counter electrode. So measure the current is linear to the concentration of glucose or lactate in our sweat, for example. In able to monitor ions such as sodium, potassium, uh, hydrogen ion, basically pH, or like a calcium, magnesium, for example, we could use ion selective electrodes. In this case, we mobilize our working electrodes with uh, ion selective film. You know, like this a film is selective to uh, the given ion. Um, for potassium ion, for, for example, it contains a, a specific ion for volumicin, which you know, the size of this ring, you know, this molecular structure you see, is matched to potassium ion. If you put this ion selective sensor in the solution contains um, um, potassium ion, potassium ion will enter this ring and set the voltage of this uh, like uh, ion selective electrode. We are measuring essentially the voltage output, the voltage difference between the ion selective electrode and the reference electrode. So according to the nurse equation, the sensitivity, you know, it's 59.16 millivolt per decade of concentration. The measured voltage is log linear, has a log linear relationship with the ion concentration. This is how we monitor ions. The third category of sensors uh, is using voltammetrics uh, analysis to monitor electroactive molecules. What is electroactive molecules? You know, these molecules, they are group molecules that can be oxidized. You know, they can either lose or donate electrons on the, electron, uh, on the electrode surface, if you apply a certain voltage. So there are many active molecules in our body of fluid, including uric acid, some amino acids, such as tyrosine, tryptophan, such, uh, some drugs, including caffeine, cocaine, you know, some hormones, such as a neuropeptide, uh, like uh, some hormone peptide, including neuropeptide Y, this is one type of electroactive peptide. To detect these electroactive molecules, we can you know, apply certain voltammetric scans, such as differential pulse voltammetry. We can apply this uh, voltage scan. They can oxidize voltage at a given voltage. They can oxidize the molecule at a given voltage. For example, if you scan DPV in sweat sample, we can see uh, two significant peaks. The first peak belongs to uric acid. Uric acid can oxidize at around 0.4 volt if you use a graphene electrode. And tyrosine is another key amino acid can be oxidized at around 0.7 volt. By reading the current height, uh, you know, which is linear to the concentration, we can uh, calculate the level of this biomarker level in our body fluid. So we can also use this to detect drug caffeine in this case. Uh, these are three main categories used for a wearable continuous monitoring right now, because not all the sensors can perform continuous monitoring. They are sensors based on DNA, based on antibodies. They can um, perform highly sensitive detection, but not very suitable for continuous monitoring. So to make this wearable sensor more like a accessible for the consumer in the future, we need to reduce the cost. We also need to make sure the sensor has high performance, it can be mass producible. Because how to get high performance? People, people typically immobilize the sensor with you know, certain nanomaterials. If you drop you know, like say the cocktail contain different kind of nanomaterials on the electrode, manually prepare each electrode by drop casting. As you can imagine, you might get a good performance, but your sensor may not be that reproducible because a sensor sensor variation will, will exist. Uh, in general, sometimes uh, the variation could be very big. And we need a mass producible way to prepare the high performance sensors. 
So recently we proposed a laser engraving approach to prepare the multimodal microfluidic based sweat sensor. As you can see here, by using carbon dioxide laser engraving, we can fabricate this beautiful graphene structure on the surface of polyimide. In fact, this laser engraving will cause the local carbonization of this polyimide surface can make graphene. By control the laser parameter, we can you know, uh, control the property of this graphene uh, like uh, composite. So uh, based on this graphene, we can develop high performance chemical sensor and physical sensor. For the chemical sensor, we can use this for the sweat analysis. For physical sensor, we can use this to monitor respiration or heart rate, which is very relevant to COVID-19. They are you know, major biomarkers for that. We could also design temperature sensors to monitor our skin temperature. So very importantly, this laser engraving can also be used to make the microfluidic system. You know, why we need microfluidics for wearable sensor? Uh, because uh, when we sample sweat, analyzing sweat, right? When uh, sweat will evaporate. So to miniaturize the evaporation of sweat influence and also to uh, like, uh, improve the temporary solution for uh, like sweat sensing because you know, when new sweat come out, we do not want the new sweat mixed with the old sweat, right? We always want to analyze the fresh sweat secreted through sweat gland. That's why we use the microfluid to sample the sweat. Uh, the new sweat we always flow through the electrode, flow through the biosensor, we can get near real-time uh, analysis. Basically, entire multimodal physical sensor, chemical sensor, and the microfluid module can be fabricated using a simple laser engraving approach. As you can imagine, could be very large scale and low cost fabricated. And this sensor, graphene-based biosensor, show very good performance compared to classic electrode. You know, you can see the much higher oxidation reduction signal compared to, you know, typical gold electrode, screen printed electrode, or glossy carbon electrode. If we do DPV scan in sweat sample, we see two significant peaks in sweat uh, from our graphene electrode. This belongs to uric acid on the left side, the right side be belongs to an amino acid tyrosine. But for other traditional or classic electrodes, we don't see significant peaks in sweat or saliva samples. That means our sensor have very good performance for chemical sensing. For physical sensing, as I said, we can design a high performance chemical sensor, uh, a physical sensor, including to monitor temperature, body temperature to monitor respiration or heart rate. And this physical sensor have very good performance as well. You know, you can see how this uh, resistance of this graphene sensor respond to temperature, respond to strain change. And surprisingly, this type of graph graphene sensor have very high mechanical robustness. You know, some people may think you engrave this graphene on the part uh, part on the plastic surface. You burn in part and maybe this graphene flag will not be very stable. They may fall off. You know, that is not true. If you make this uh, biosensor or physical sensor uh, control the laser parameter properly, they are quite robust. You see the the resistance of this graphene sensor maintain nearly the same after ten thousand cycles of mechanical you know bending. That means they are very mechanically robust. So for the microfluidic part, you know, based on simulation, we see they can sample the sweat very efficiently. And when the new sweat come out, it can push away the old sweat. It takes two to three minutes to fully refresh old sweat. That means our sensor maybe there is a will be delay, roughly around two minutes, but two minutes is pretty short. We think for continuous wearable molecule sensing. And we see this how sweat come out, uh, the enter microfluidics then flow out from the outlet. And we did uh, some flow tests. And you see when, when we uh, like uh, supply, uh, as they say, artificial sweat and the biosensor keep uh, performing the continuous sensing, you get a consistent signal. And when you change the input uh, biomarker concentration, it will take two to three minutes to reach the new stable values. That means our sensor can really get close to real time house monitoring. And we typically do the integrated system, not only de develop a biosensor patch, but also develop the entire system to collect data. And we believe that for wearable sensor data is most important. We want to collect data that contains rich information about our house. Then we want to analyze the data, right? So we did a wireless integration and uh, most of our devices has Bluetooth wireless communication capability. And we can package our device into wristband, headband. You can wear this at different body parts. We can use cell phone to continuously collect data. 
for some of our human study, we can give the people uh, sensors and cell phone. They can run outside, for example, they bring the sensor back. We can collect data from their cell phone. So this is some typical curve we collected during physical activities. You can see potassium, sodium, glucose, lactate temperature over time. And we could also monitor, you know, uh, uric acid, some amino acid level from our sweat. And we typically validate our sensor reading with a gold standard, could be ELISA analysis, uh, could be HPLC or GCMS, the mass spectrum based analysis to make sure we can measure the target accurately. So until now, I mean, some people may have questioned because we are working on sweat sensor. So what if I don't have sweat while I'm doing exercise? Some people may ask. Another question is uh, for many patients, they cannot even do vigorous exercise. Right? They're very sick. They uh, usually like stay uh, on the bed for a long time. It's hard for them to do vigorous exercise. In this case, how to make sure a sensor, sweat sensor can be still be useful, right? So we have to address one major challenge now. So how can we access sweat beyond exercise? Can we get a sweat continuously and reliably without even doing exercise? Right? That's a very good point we have to address to make sure our device can be used by most people. And we uh, found that there is a process to locally extract sweat called endophoresis. So, you know, in a clinical setting, people use this type of small equipment to extract sweat. Basically, you apply a current through the skin. There are two hydrogel here. The hydrogel contains uh, like a certain type of drugs for the pyrocarbon. When you apply current through the skin, the positively charged drug molecules will enter below the uh, skin and st stimulate the sweat gland. It will trigger local sweat. So inspired by this, we developed this integrated system that combines you know, uh, sweat extraction and sensing. As you can see here, uh, it has two operation modes. Everything is controlled by cell phone. We can click a button from cell phone if we want to do sweat analysis. And the, you know, the current will be applied through the skin and trigger local sweating process. And uh, I want to emphasize that you don't need to always apply current. All you need to apply is a few minutes current. Then you don't need a current anymore. The sweat will continuously come out from this small area, not, from, not much from other body parts, mainly local sweat extraction. And in mode two, when sweat continuously come out, you, the sensor can perform real time sweat analysis. So uh, in collaboration with the Stanford uh, School of Medicine, we actually characterize the sweat induction process. We can use different type of drugs and the different dose of the drugs to control you know, how fast we sweat and how long we sweat and how much we sweat eventually. So it, it is a controllable process and with some certain type of drug, even with a few minutes stimulation, we can sweat for a few days. So, um, this is quite promising for clinical study, as you can imagine. Uh, even I'm doing my computer work, you know, this, I'm, I'm still sweating maybe from this small area after I'm phoresis. You know, this is attractive. We can wear our device, it's more like wearing an Apple Watch. You don't need to apply current and you don't need to worry about uh, are you sweating or not. Sweat will continuously come out from this small area. And we can use this device for different clinical applications. Firstly, the gold standard, uh, you know, classic application for cystic fibrosis diagnosis, as I said earlier. For cystic fibrosis, it's a genetic disease. The diagnosis in clinically, uh, in clinical is based on sweat chloride. So which take, you know, one week, you extract sweat, send the sweat to a lab, wait one week to get some data. But, you know, working with the Stanford Cystic Fibrosis Center, we apply our device on the healthy people and on the patient, as you can see, we can get the data accurately, I would say uh, within 20 to 25 minutes. You can see this clearly this chloride and sodium level from healthy people, uh, you know, uh, levels are much lower than, you know, the levels from the patients. Considering the gold standard for adults diagnosis is based on sweat chloride higher than 60 millimolar. If you look at, look at this statistic value, we can say that our sensor can be used for screening like a cystic fibrosis. The second application is again very COVID related is metabolic and nutritional monitoring. And we know that for people, for COVID patients, for people with like an um, existing health condition, especially with uh, metabolic syndrome, you know, obesity people, uh, like people with the type two diabetes or prediabetes, they suffer from high risk of COVID-19 in, in general. 
And uh, I actually also propose, you know, precision nutrition initiative in uh, like a in the next decade pro uh, for the, as a naked uh, next decade one of the focus area because you know if you control diet properly we can reduce the risk for developing metabolic syndrome right now metabolic syndrome is affecting one third uh, u.s adult population already you know the risk factor including high blood uh, sugar high blood pressure and uh, you know unhealthy cholesterol level obesity and high uric acid level and a wearable sensor can play a very important role to really tell us, you know, our nutritional status, to monitor our nutritional intake, and to uh, give us a very early warning, and, uh, and to let us perform timely nutritional intervention. So the best uh, healthcare is really prevention, right? To give people early warning by changing the lifestyle, by letting people eat healthier. Uh, in, in this case, people reduce the chance for developing more severe health conditions. By the way, metabolic syndrome is a major risk factor for developing more severe problems, including kidney problem, cardiovascular diseases, and type 2 diabetes. So we're working with uh, UCLA Clinical Nutrition uh, Director, Dr. Zhao Ping Li. We are applying our sensor to monitor a number of different nutrients in our body fluids. One of the examples people have high interest is glucose. Can we monitor glucose non-invasively by analyzing sweat, right? So we did some pilot study. We found that if you, you know, have dietary intake, your sweat glucose will follow blood glucose, both will increase. But of course, this uh, correlation for glucose between, you know, sweat and blood is complicated. It's still under investigation. I think uh, the wearable sensor provide a good platform to study this correlation in a continuous fashion because if people, they're mixed reading about, uh, you know, good correlation, better like a uh, correlation in different reports. So the best way is to really continuously monitor both. We can compare, we can be using certain algorithm to correlate them better. So we successfully applied our sensor for another major metabolic problem of monitoring, GOT. The gout is uh, uh, one of the most common, I would say, most common inflammatory arthritis. It's affecting tens of millions of population around the world already. And my brother has gout as well. One of the problems for gout patients is they cannot eat too much red meat, seafood, or drink beer. If you, for example, if you're a gout patient, if you're red meat, seafood, or beer lover, they'll be quite painful because when they eat this type of food, they will suffer from gout attack, which is quite painful. You see uric acid crystallize near the joint would trigger a lot of pains. So the biomarker for gout is uric acid. And for gout patients, you know, uh, you know, large portion of gout patients is because of genetic reason they develop gout. And also a good portion, they develop gout because of lifestyle. If you eat unhealthy food uh, over time, uh, likely you will develop gout. So monitoring gout is important for healthy people for many tries, uh, like uh, the chance for developing gout, and also very important for gut patients to really avoid the flare up for gut attack and also help them to personalize their medication for gut low, I mean, urate lowering therapy. Basically they eat medication to lower the uric acid level. And uh, successfully applying this wearable sweat sensor page on the skin, we can see that sweat uric acid follow blood one pretty closely. This is a healthy subject, a male, female subject, you see sweat and blood show very similar pattern. And we actually recruited a patient with a gut and subject with hypouricemia and a healthy subject. We see that, you know, for the patient with the gut, they have much higher sweat and serum uric acid compared to healthy subject. And if we track one healthy subject over seven hours, we can see that sweat follow closely even every hour to the blood one and the plot of the sweat and blood correlation about uric acid, we get a correlation factor of 0.864. It's pretty high already, considering we didn't do uh, much calibration, personal calibration. It's just general plot. It's already very high correlation. And this is just one example. We can monitor the nutrients, monitor and metabolize in our body fluid continuously, and that could reflect our body fluid level. And this could be very useful for personalized nutritional and metabolic monitoring. So one more application I want to share with you is using uh, our wearable sensor for therapeutic drug monitoring. You know, right now, like a therapeutic drug monitor is a major problem we are facing. Uh, for, for some drugs, you know, drug very metabolism very person to person. If you compare a, a, like a child with an adult, the metabolic rate, the metabolic rate of the drug can change very quickly, right? 
for many drugs, in fact, they have very narrow therapeutic window. So what is therapeutic window? If you see, uh, if you take the, a drug level too high, it, you can cause, I mean, this drug can cause a major side effect, right? If the medication level is too low, um, this patient may not get effective treatment. So you'd better leave the drug level in a body within this green zone, which is therapeutic window in this case, not too much side effect and still get effective treatment. But you know, for many drugs, the therapeutic window is very low. Uh, I mean, very, very narrow. You have to control the dose very well. And um, people have to come to the clinic, draw the blood, wait several days to, I mean, to see the blood drug level. And the blood drug level change very rapidly, you know, even uh, over hours. So it's very difficult to do, to study the pharmacokinetic in this way. And using wearable sensor, we can non-invasively monitor the drug level at home. You don't have to come to the clinic to draw the blood, to wait several days to get a drug level. Especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? You better stay home to monitor the parameters of, uh, I mean, health-related parameters, including the drug dose personalization uh, at home using our telemedicine tools. So we started with the model drug caffeine. You know, caffeine is, is something we can easily do human study because it is a drug and we can work with our, you know, subject or students to dose the subject easily. Because caffeine, we are drinking coffee every day. We can control the dose of this drug by drinking different shots of coffee, one shot, two shots, three shots. In this case, we can continuously monitor the caffeine level in our body fluids, as you can see. We detect the caffeine using carbonyl tube electrode. This nanomaterial immobilization is very important to reach the desired sensitivity. As you can see, we can monitor caffeine level at my, a few micromolar level. And uh, after we drink coffee or take caffeine, uh, in the first hour, you see caffeine level in our body fluid just increase uh, gradually and reach a peak at uh, right after one hour. That means, you know, uh, after drinking coffee, after one hour probably, that's time to feel uh, most energetic. So uh, right now we are working with the City of Hope to work on several different kinds of cancer drugs. We have recruited over 50 patients already. And uh, among our, during the recruiting process, you know, over 75% of patients said yes, they want to join the study. And this is a very high rate, as you can imagine, including uh, this in indicating this technology has good potential for the patients. So another topic I want to discuss briefly is about mental health. Also a very important aspect during the COVID-19 pandemic, why most people stay at home. Uh, our students in general, uh, many people will need more mental care. And stress and mental health, you know, stress, Many diseases are stress-related, including anxiety, depression, PTSD, cardiovascular diseases, and cancers. So, but I mean, depression, you know, and stress, they are very important, but very difficult to measure. Right now, for stress, how stress is monitored, you see, it's based on questionnaire. You fill a bunch of questionnaire and you get, you get a score about your stress level. As you can imagine, this is very subjective. For depression, the same. For depression, there is PHQ-9, it's also a questionnaire. Even for suicide, my collaborator is expert on this. Uh, she, uh, he was joking, if this person wants to suicide, uh, he or she will not tell the truth. Even you give you know, the questionnaire, right? It is a very subjective analysis. So we need a, a very good way to quantify stress and mental health conditions. So one of the important biomarkers we are looking at is stress hormone, cortisol. By, based on them, stress hormone, right? It's the most well-known well stress hormone, cortisol, basically. Cortisol level is a reflection of our stress level. When we experience stress, our body cortisol level increases, in fact. And to monitor cortisol, I mean, people typically draw blood, but a blood drawn or finger pricks, no matter, or venous blood draw by the self, you know, is a stress inducing event. You are creating stress by, you want to monitor stress, but you're creating more stress by poking finger to draw blood. That is the problem, right? That's why very uh, like attractively will be non-invasively monitor cortisol level by, you know, from our skin, for example, using like a sweat analysis. That's why uh, we uh, developed uh, this uh, portable system, a um, telemedicine platform allow us to quickly track the cortisol level in our, from our skin, in fact. You see, this is still based on mass producible graphene biosensors, very low cost, we can prepare this. We can use the uh, amino uh, sensor, immobilize antibodies on the uh, graphene, we can perform cortisol sensing. 
And the our sensor can perform, you know, rapid analysis of sweat and saliva cortisol. Even with one minute incubation, we can get uh, sufficient data already and uh, accuracy in, in general. We validated our sensor with the gold standard ELISA. And uh, with this, we analyzing our cortisol level uh, during the day. You see uh, the level of in serum, saliva, sweat, I mean, morning and afternoon, they show very similar pattern. Although, you know, saliva and sweat cortisol level uh, in general, they are much lower than blood ones. By the way, I want to also emphasize that the cortisol, we are not only look at the value, we also look at the pattern. So the circadian rhythm, cortisol follows circadian rhythm. Every morning we have high cortisol level, afternoon or evening we have low cortisol level. So every day is like this. So the circadian pattern of cortisol level is related to different mental health conditions. For example, for people with depression, people with PTSD, they have like a different circadian pattern of cortisol compared to healthy people. You know, like a major depression is already influencing more than 260 million people around the world. So we want to monitor the dynamics of a cortisol level. That's why we, we see, we track the, the cortisol level in one subject for six days. Every day you see a circadian pattern. Morning is higher than afternoon. Morning is higher than afternoon. And if we plot the sweat and the serum cortisol level, we see a, a very high a linear correlation as well. You see uh, 0.87 sweat versus zero. We think it's a pretty attractive uh, indication to show that we can monitor the code level non-invasively by analyzing sweat in general. And, uh, and our turnout time is pretty fast, less than like uh, two minutes in general, we can get the value already. So not only we track the correlation, we want to make sure our device can monitor stress response. I mean, during the stress response, can you catch the dynamic changes of this cortisol, right? That's why we see, you see, uh, we apply the stress, stressors on the subjects. One stressor is aerobic exercise. If we let people do vigorous exercise, this subject will get stressed. You see the cortisol level increases during the exercise. And after the finished exercise, they decreases. And for the athletes, they decrease faster because the athletes they're getting used to this stress process. And this is about, because exercise induced sweat by the cell as well. What if in other scenarios, how do I monitor stress? Why I'm not doing vigorous exercise, right? As we mentioned, we can use antifluorosis to induce sweat. In this case, uh, we apply a standard pen test, cold pressure test. This is also a stressor. Basically you put a hand into ice water, uh, you can feel a, a lot of pain in fact. And in this case, it creates a lot of stress as well. Yeah, I was the first subject in my group to do this type of study. My students are looking at me, in fact, to make me, make me feel even more stressful. Eventually, I, I realized, you know, every one of them, they put one dollar, they just like bet how long my hand can stay in this eye of the water. So uh, we did a more human study on this. We can uh, see that using this type of uh, like, a, you know, stressor, we can still track the dynamic changes of the cortisol. And right now we are working with NASA, you know, to apply this sensor along with our other sensors to monitor like the mental health condition for astronauts. So come back to like COVID-19. I mean, we, did, uh, we developed uh, this uh, wearable biosensors that can track the different biomarkers from our body fluids already, right? Um, but, you know, like, uh, Last year, we all faced this challenge. Like we want to contribute to COVID-19 uh, diagnosis as well, because we are in the sensor field. At that time, we were thinking about how can we adapt our existing like uh, technology to develop some rapid COVID tests. So look at the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. You know, it contains different proteins and the gold standard is RT-PCR detect the RNA. And we are working on protein detection. In fact, if you look at protein biomarker, we can see our body produce a biomarker antibodies such as IgG and IgM. And we also produce you know, inflammatory proteins, including CRP and cytokines. So these are all important uh, like uh, biomarkers related with our health condition. For example, IgG, IgM, IgA tell us you know, whether we have immunity. Basically, we have, uh, have you ever, uh, ever get infected before or not? So the, um, by the way, of the virus antigen, the proteins in the virus, they will tell us uh, whether we are currently on the infection or not. This inflammatory biomarker will tell us the severity of the infection. And this work shows that, you know, how fast you can do a test is critical. 
And if you do a test where two days to no data, it's very difficult to, to convey the COVID-19. The efficiency is much low, right? You will miss a lot of cases because every day people can get infected. If your turnout time is like one hour or within a day, uh, I mean, it's much more effective to combat COVID-19. That's why we developed this uh, multiplex COVID-19 diagnosis platform based on our laser engraving technology. We, we showed that we use this laser engraved graphene for uh, metabolic monitoring, for cortisol sensing, and we apply the technology for multiplex COVID-19 diagnosis. So it is a multiplex system that can simultaneously track virus antigen virus antibody and the inflammatory biomarker. We track three different categories of biomarker. This will tell a full picture of a covenant infection. For example, we use N protein. N protein is a virus energy. It will tell us whether we are currently on the infection or not. If we are on the infection, we will detect a positive signal from N protein or S protein. And we detect uh, IgG and IgM as well using our sensor. It will tell us you know, have you ever get infected before? Or how long ago you get infected? Because IgG and IgM tell different information. IgM come out first in our body when we get infected and disappear after a certain time. But IgG come out at a later time, but last much longer in our body. Basically uh, monitor this, we can know, you know, like immunity information, immunity status of our body. And CRP is an inflammatory biomarker. Basically we will tell us how severe our infection is. So the entire uh, technology you know, uh, platform, I would say the prototype can do uh, multiplex sensing within 10 minutes in both sweat, uh, not sweat, in both blood and saliva sample. In this case, you know, saliva analysis is quite attractive. Right now at Caltech, we know we all do saliva tests already. It's non-invasive and it's more suitable for at-home tests. So we can do all these tests within 10 minutes, in fact. And you see it's based on mass producible uh, electrode and this electrode material cost is less than four cents in general quite cheap right plus more like a reagent we can make this sensor in general at a at a level of few dollars so uh, our multiplex systems show very good selectivity over other you know major like a, like a interferences in general and we showed that our like a sensor can sh uh, perform very accurate sensing versus go to standard ELISA. Even with just one minute's incubation with the, the patient sample, we show that our sensor can show very different reading. We can distinguish healthy people and a patient already. You see on the left one, the, the dark color is uh, one patient, so the light color is uh, for the healthy people. With one minute is sufficient for incubation time. And we performed uh, more samples with the COVID patient sample and healthy people's sample. We see that from, we can distinguish all the you know, subject infected for patient sample value, they are higher than all, I mean, every healthy patient sample. We can distinguish 100% based on the sample we analyzed. That means our sensor is quite sensitive and we can successfully identify this COVID patient from healthy people. And we also show that based on severity difference, we identify different levels of these inflammatory biomarkers showing the CRP can be used for uh, monitor severity of this COVID infection. So the last part of my talk, I want to briefly uh, discuss about how we can power future telemedicine biosensors. You know, like uh, for uh, for certain scenario, uh, it's not readily available to like uh, for the, like power recharge. Let's say if uh, warfighters uh, performing certain ta task in the field, there are no readily accessible electricity for charging this wearable sensor. When I have more functionality, it will post more high power. I would say high power requirement already. Since many of our uh, sensors are doing body fluid, biofluid analysis, one question coming into uh, our mind is, uh, can we use biofluid to power our wearable sensor, right? Then we recently developed an entirely biofuel powered electronic scheme with a wearable sensor. So we harvest energy from the chemicals in our body fluid. For example, we can harvest energy from the glucose in our blood or lactate in our sweat because you know, their level is pretty high. So we developed this biofuel cell power, the wearable sensor. We get sufficient power from these chemicals in our sweat to power multiple biosensors and to power electronic circuitry and to power Bluetooth communication. You know, Bluetooth communication consume a lot of power already, but we, how we can achieve that? Nanotechnology play a very important role here. As you can see here, we immobilized our anode 
the bio is fuel cell anode with you know nickel nano uh, structure uh, followed by graphene coating and followed by carbon nanotube coating. For the cathode, we use the carbon nanotube network followed by this platinum core nanoparticle decoration. This like a uh, anode, you know, using this nanomaterial, we can enhance the electric uh, active electrocatalytic surface area by three thousand times. So based on this, we can harvest energy from our body fluids, from our sweat, untreated sweat, at the power of two to three cent a milliwatt per centimeter square. You know, several milliwatt per centimeter square. It's very high already. So based on this, you know, we also show that not only we can get high power, and our technology can also deliver very high stability. Because typically, biofuel cell they suffer from poor stability. This platinum cobalt nanoparticle can dramatically enhance the stability of this biofuel cell in the biofluids. You know, typically, you know, the platinum electrode, you know, within one hour, you see the, the performance decreases a lot. But our sensor, you know, platinum cobalt based part, like an electrode, can last much longer. If you coat it with an unnaping film, they can remain stable performance over a very long time. Here is a 15 hour test followed by 24 hour storage. There is another 15 hour test. You see the performance is nearly the same. And we did a very interesting power management to allow us to continuously monitor uh, like uh, this, our health information and wirelessly send the data to our cell phone just using charging, discharging. This is entire system, you know, it's battery free. We don't use any battery in the wearable sensor. We can entirely harvest energy from sweat and power everything. So we can, uh, we showed that this uh, like a biofuel cell system is very stable. We can continuously charging, discharging for 50 hours. You see that they have nearly the same performance. And even in raw sweat, we showed the 24 hour performance, still very stable performance. We can taking advantage of this battery free uh, wearable system. We can continue to track this metabolic information. Again, it's very important to monitor our nutritional status uh, to minimize the chance for uh, like a COVID nineteen infection. For you see like uh, all the risks, you know the urea, ammonia, glucose, pH. We can continue to track using this biofuel powered uh, electronic skin. And in collaboration with another Caltech professor, Professor Azita Imami. And we have developed this in an integrated circuit-based system for energy harvesting and sensing. You see, um, Professor Imami developed this uh, integrated IC. Integrated uh, IC chip is only one by 1 by 1.3 uh, like millimeter, very small for signal processing and wireless communication. Entirely packaged the system with our biofuel cell is only five millimeter by six millimeters, so it's very small. So we can, you know, incorporate more functionality and uh, get a high power by increase a little bit of size, you know, this is a, a good way to achieve a low power, battery free and multifunctional wearable sensing. And the last example is really, we can also harvest energy from our human motion, not only from sweat. Why we are, because we are doing a physical activity every day. Can we get energy from our body motion, right? So we use a triple electrical nano generator to harvest energy from mechanical motion to convert the energy into electricity. And we can, uh, we used a flexible printed circuit uh, PCB, uh, a flexible PCB based technology. This we can prepare this nan nano generator uh, with very high robustness because they can very they are very reliable. They are based on commercially available PCB technology. They can work very long time, and we can continuously harvest energy from our body motion and charging uh, the capacitor and power the entire uh, like a wearable sensor. Again, this is the entire sensor is there is no battery. We don't need any battery to power it, and we can continuously collect information about uh, uh, our like a uh, house uh, uh, from the, like this battery-free system. So to summarize. Uh, we uh, I presented our recent development on the telemedicine biosensors for personalized healthcare, including sweat sensor, including saliva-based COVID tests. You know, and we think these portable and wearable biosensors can enable at-home health monitoring and minimize the chance for people to have to go out to come to the clinic. You know, we think this type of wearable portable sensor could potentially revolutionize the future personalized healthcare. You know, importantly. The continuous health information collected by this wearable sensor can be used, you know, if we combine this with machine learning, it can be used for many fundamental and clinical investigations. And it will play a very important role, especially in preventive care. So in the end, I would like to thank my group at Caltech and my collaborators 
um, you know, in engineering departments, also in the clinical um, centers. Uh, at last, I also want to thank our funding support and uh, thank you everyone for attending my seminar. I would like to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wei. This was so much information and presented with so much enthusiasm. Um, we're, we're really um, honored and delighted to hear your talk. Thanks for sharing your, um, your uh, latest, greatest work and just especially with how impactful and meaningful it is um, right you. now. So if you could just stay with us for a few more minutes to answer some questions. There are a couple that came in. Um, so I would very much encourage the audience um, to submit their questions, please, via Q&A section. You can see that at the bottom, right next to the raise hand, um, there's the option to do that. And I'm happy to, uh, to be the messenger. So the first question came in um, is about commercialization. Do you, uh, what do you think is the killer app, so to speak, right? Or what is the killer product, right? Since you're working on so many different things that you can detect. Um, what, what are you thinking would be the best one to commercialize first? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I, I think it's hard for me to say one because I like a multiple project. For me, of great interest, there are you know, metabolic monitoring because of nutritional metabolic monitoring is, uh, we can think about uh, a device like a Fitbit which allow us uh, to track you know, metabolic and nutritional status. And also mental health, of course, is of great interest as well and to track a stress level, to, tra to track the uh, depression level. These are something like I think uh, um, we are like uh, have very uh, high potential um, for the consumer like a market point of view. So metabolic sensors, just to make sure that we're clear. Yes, metabolic sensor metabolic and the stress sensor. monitor, I would say both I like, it's hard to say one. Okay. Mm -hmm. How long do you expect a sensor like that to last? Uh, it really depends on sensors. I think some some type of sensor, like our sodium potassium sensor, they can last for several months. You know, we can uh, continue to use the sensor for a very long time. But some sensors they don't last very long. For example, glucose lactate sensor, they are based on enzymes. Uh, we will need to rely on the enzyme activity as well. But uh, recently, we also make a very uh, we also have made a very good progress. This type of sensor can last for at least for several days, and we think for wearable sensor, several days is good enough. At least one day is already good enough because we made this sensor at a large scale and low cost, and we made it disposable. We can easily replace the sensor page um, you know, within a few seconds in general. Even I wear my Apple Watch, I have to charge my watch every day anyway, <laughs> in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you just be, I guess I'm, I'm going to abuse my power of being the Q&A moderator to uh, push you a little further in that. Um, so when you say some last a long time, some last a day, how would you know that a priori? Is that something that the consumer would know a priori or is that something you have to test on your own? Or is that, how does that, how does one have reliable information for how long a sensor is reliable for? Yeah, I would say for the sensor we design, if we know is this type of sensor, let's say glucose sensor, we can tell the consumer how long this sensor will last. It's for example, like uh, our commercial glucose strips, right? We have ordered these strips, they can say this strip, I mean, for the room temperature story, they can last for four uh, months. Of course, this is for one time use. And we can say our sensor on the room temperature story, they can last for, let's say, uh, several months and once you start to use it, let's say every two days you replace it with a new patch. That's something we can provide this type of information depending which target we are monitoring. I see. So it's a, a little bit like having an expiration date. Yes, that's right. That's right. And it's a disposable okay. patch. We suggest for them daily replacement or weekly replacement depending what we are monitoring. Yeah, great. Uh -huh. um, can you, uh, here's another question that came in. Can you reapply the sensors after you rip it off? So, or once it's you, are they disposable? Uh, they, are, they are disposable, as I said. I, I talked multiple slides about how we can mass reduce the sensor at a very low cost. I mean, eventually the sensor could be cost like just a few cents or even tens of cents, right? We can easily replace uh, this sensor with a new patch. And we could potentially reuse the sensor, but I don't see the reason why we need to do that if they are very low cost, you know? We place a new one, it's like a bandage. If we use this bandage for a day, we can apply another one next day. The electronic part is re reusable, but the sensor patch part, they're flexible, they're made on the plastic, you know, they are very low cost in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so a few questions came in on the physiological cues. So mm -hmm. one of them would be, how do you deal with um, variations in, say, the pH level, right? So if you have 
sweat or saliva, there are different pH levels. Does the chemistry work still? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, like we do uh, for wearable sensing, when we deal with the sensor, you know, signal, they are different from for in vitro analysis. In a laboratory setting, every temperature, like a pH, you can control. But for the um, for sweat, you know, there is large pH variation. There is also uh, like a skin temperature like a variation. So in typically, we do uh, for the type of sensor that influenced by pH, we do a pH calibration. For example, glucose sensor, we do pH calibration. And for typical uh, uh, like a current best. Uh, uh, chemical sensor, we do a temperature calibration as well. This is a, calibration is performed in real time because we have a sensor built in the system. We typically, we have a sensor array, but temperature calibration, pH calibration can be performed within the microcontroller in situ. And of course, there are many other sensors like ion-based sensors, they are not influenced by the pH, uh, uh, like a uh, influencing factor. pH have minimal influence for this type of sensors. Mm -hmm. All right, what about other physiological cues? So for example, for electrochemical sensors, you know, with biofouling and mm -hmm. just larger, longer length scales and time scales, sorry, not length scales, with longer time scales of being mm -hmm. in the body, how do you handle biofouling and how can you detect that? Yeah, uh, I mean, again, it's a very good question. So firstly, we are not doing implantable devices. So the sweat, uh, the composition is so much so simpler no to blood. Yet. The falling is not there severe. And uh, again, we are not using like an implantable device using for several months, right? We use for days or weeks. As I said, it's disposable, we can replace this one. We just need to make sure within days or weeks, it can maintain the same uh, level or very similar level, something like, uh, you know, within the like uh, error tolerance, I would say. Okay, here's a very interesting question. When you start a project, do you consider the public need first and develop according to that application or specifically to address that need? Or do you think of a technology first and then head out to see what, what's in the, what fits the market? I would, say, cool I, would, I would say both ways. Sometimes, you know, I, I mean, we have a good technology. We think about uh, how we can use it. Um, but, you know, even something I want to do, I have I already talked with my clinical collaborators because their needs and our needs are different sometimes. For example, one of the projects, I want to monitor these markers using our technology. Then my collaborator said, mm, well, in a clinical setting, we don't care this marker. Even in the literature, this is important. We care the other one. Then I adapt, you know, like a change our project direction to, to address the like actual clinical needs in general. Okay. Okay. I think it's an interdisciplinary topic, right? Uh, it requires close collaboration between engineering, material science, chemistry, and the cl uh, clinicians in general. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you design your sensors, how do you determine the target size? Since, since the sweat, um, you, you know, it can cover a larger or a small area, but certainly you want to be certain to capture enough material to detect. How, how do you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly we wanted our device not too large. And uh, typical our size, our sensor size, you know, uh, sensor by itself is small, it's a few millimeter size, but the entire pe sensor patch, generally they are like a, a, a centimeter or two centimeter. And as this question mentioned, we want to make sure we sample enough sweat. And we also want to make sure the device will not be too bulky. <laughs> I think it right. is a balance in general, we need to think about it. And also depending like how much sweat we have, right? Like uh, uh, with, I think with uh, like uh, uh, right now, we, we facing the challenge is really, we want a reliable long-term sweat induction. If we re continuously extract sweat uh, over long time, the sweat rate is pretty low. And we need a, like, a, I was not too small area, is a few centimeter, I would say one to two centimeter sides to sample sweat continuously to get a, you know, higher temporary resolution, right? It's a matter of temporary resolution. If we have very little sweat or very small patch, we take a longer time to get a fresh sensor, a fresh sweat on the sensor in general. So what would you, but to really quantify this, what would be the smallest and the largest sensors that you've made or that you uh, typically work with? Yeah, for sensor, it's the uh, smallest one could be a few hundred micrometer, but the patch size is ranging from several millimeter to a few centimeter, I think. The patch size is a microfluidic patch. We want sample sweat from this small area, right? Right, of course. Yeah. So what is that small area? One centimeter? Yeah, one centimeter, two centimeters. One centimeter, two, okay. Something like that, Great. yeah. Thank you. It's like um, a okay, you know, it's, it's a little bit after five, so I'm going to read off two questions. One is very, very, 
uh, technical, and then we're going to uh, set you free so that you can actually go and focus on this wonderful work instead of telling us about it. All right, the first question is uh, technical. Um, so by the way, I should really say that everyone who is sending um, messages is uh, saying great talk, terrific talk, and thank you very much for sharing. So you're getting a lot of fans here. Um, quick technical question. How are you able to me measure uh, so many electrochemical impedance spectra over so many different frequencies in less than 10 minutes? So the EIS spectra usually takes a long time over a single frequency, but you're collecting these signals over multiple frequencies in a rapid plex device. Oh, by the way, we, we do not use uh, like a ERS uh, with, uh, like sensing. We typically use IT, you know, we just apply voltage measure current. So in this case, uh, the response time is pretty short. Within one minute, I would say, we can do multiplex channel reading uh, simultaneously. Uh, even okay. half a minute is sufficient in general. Okay, all right. That, because otherwise, if you use the IS, it would be... Yeah, too some long, can right? take longer, for example, like a... Uh, like a uh, even DPV, our differential power photometric one, when we monitor electroactive molecules, they take like half a minute or even one minute standard scan. So this will take a, a like for EIS, I would take a, take a few minutes to do the monitoring, and we we don't use that often. But I would say the general our monitor time is from few seconds to one minute right now for few most of our That is so impressive. <laughs> All right, um, this is this is um, this is really answering a lot of people's questions and I really appreciate how, how uh, engaged the audience has been. So I'm going to leave with this last uh, question, which is, in your opinion, are the chemical or the physical sensors more reliable and which ones would you recommend for going forward? Well, I mean, uh, I would say if I have to say which one is more reliable, of course, physical sensor is more reliable. If you only measure resistance, right, and you can make it like a working for a very long time. That's why, you know, there's more challenge. That's why no commercially available wearable chemical sensor yet. There are more challenges, but we, it's not like we have to pick one, right? Chemical sensor provide a lot of more meaningful information. If we only monitor heart rate, we only know this not much information. But if you monitor glucose, you already can, you know how glucose is important already. Cortisol, there are so many important biomarkers we cannot monitor using physical sensor we have to explore more chemical sensor eventually i think a multimodal sensor data fusion will be the key to address the actual problem right now you know machine learning if we only do deal with heart rate or ecg again the application is limited but with the numerous is chemical biomarker information if we could collect continuously the application is really enormous i think all right um, I just want to share my enthusiasm uh, with everyone else. Thank you so much for the great talk, uh, Wei. You have such a bright future ahead of you. I think it's now a matter of what do you choose to tackle, right? So, <laughs> thank, you. thank you so, so much. Thank you very, very much. Um, again, I really appreciate the audience's questions and participation. And as you can see, there's um, the website uh, there on the link for you. And uh, please continue to attend these seminars. It means a lot to us. And have a wonderful Tuesday evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Wei. <laughs> Thank you, Julia.